Welcome everyone to the Data Science Hangout. Uh, this is an open space for current and aspiring data science leaders to connect and chat about some of the more human-centric questions that you all have around leadership. Um, and we'll focus on questions that are most important to you all. So I just wanna say there's three ways that you can ask questions. So you could jump in live. You can also put a question in the Zoom chat and I can call on you and pass the mic over to you. But we also have a Slido link as well, which Robert will share in just a second here. And there you can ask anonymous questions as well. Um, but just a quick note that the session will be recorded and shared up to YouTube for anyone who's missed it as well. And I am so excited to be joined by my co-host for today, Rami Crispin. And Rami, I am very grateful to who jumped in here the last minute. We had a little uh, switch up with uh, one of the leaders' dates and Rami was able to, to jump in here. He manages a, a data science team uh, focused on cost optimization and capacity planning. He's also the author of a hands-on uh, time series analysis book and several R packages. I think many of you may have seen Rami on LinkedIn and, and Twitter and from uh, various presentations that he's given to the community as well. Um, but I'd love to turn it over to you, Rami, and have you introduce yourself and, and chat a bit about some of the work that you do. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you for the invite and thank you everyone to join. So I'm Rami Crispin. I'm a data science manager at Apple. Um, I'm not representing in this talk Apple or cannot talk about uh, on my work at Apple, unfortunately, the, uh, due to the short time, I didn't have the time to go for the, our legal approval, uh, but I will be happy to answer any general questions about data science and, uh, you know, uh, the life of, uh, you know, workflow and life of data science. I'm, um, as Rachel mentioned, I'm really active in the open source community in the since the COVID starts mainly on uh, creating packages that related to COVID-19 data. Um, okay, and thank you for the invite, happy to be here. Definitely, thank you, Rami. And I know we had just a few minutes to connect before this as well, um, but would really love to kick off the discussion with asking, what is something that you're most excited about in data science right now? Uh, I, I would say probably like the boring stuff that's going on in, in data science tools that are coming that related to production, uh, like, uh, you know, the Docker and GitHub actions, the combination with R, and it, it's, it's amazing how simple is you can, today you can take those uh, free and open source tools and put your R code in production. Um, so I'm, I'm I'm really excited about, you know, that those tools are just coming, the more tools are create, creating new tools every day. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm less excited about, you know, the other, other stuff, the more sexy stuff, the deep learning, and that's, I think, I think it's also important, but the productionize of your code, I think that's what I'm really excited about. Awesome. Yeah. And I've seen a few uh, great talks that you've given for meetups on that too. So we'll be sure to, sure to share those links with people too. While we're waiting for a few questions to come in from the audience, I know something that's come up quite a bit on these calls is how leaders handle that transition from an individual contributor to a manager role. Um, and I know this is something that you've experienced as well. And I'm, I'm Curious to chat more about this and, and what it's been like for you. Yeah, so I, I think, you know, the starting point that I, I love to code and as an individual contributor, you you do a lot of coding, especially in R. And uh, when I did started do the transition to manager, I thought that I could continue to code, not as much as, but um, at least like, you know, half of my time and then in during the transition I realized that you need to give away some of your coding uh, and you know the trade-off that you start to someone that uh, has a passion to coding 
uh, it was, I think, uh, you know, the, it took me a while to recognize that I just need to do less of the coding and focus on the important stuff. You don't want to be the bottleneck that people are waiting for PRs and you're just yeah. in a meeting all days. And, you know, so that was the tough part, but then like you, as a manager, uh, I think your role is to help uh, the other data scientists to uh, do the work. Uh, so I think it's also important. Uh, so that's, I think, the trade-off when you're moving to do like a data science scoping uh, and general project management. But the hard time is the <laughs> doing less coding, if I, if for my experience. How did you actually make that transition then? Was it also like by doing some of this stuff in your free time and working on open source packages, does that help you with that? Or? That was my, you know, my running you know my free time to do more it, it, yeah I, I started to do more coding in my free time it's like the you're afraid to lose the connection with the ground right that you are starting to do other stuff and you're know, disconnecting from what happening on you know the first time where the important stuff are happening i and i enjoy it so uh, it's the combination of the two um so I, you know, I, what was my runaway to do more on my free time, more open source, but I think over time it will be, it will reduce that's life, right? You need to recognize that you need, if you want to go to management, that's the, the cost that you need to pay. Yeah. And I see an anonymous question that just came in around this. Did you, did you know that you wanted to make that jump to management or was it just the right opportunity? How did you make that decision to become a manager? I, I, I knew from the first place that uh, that's the, you know, from career perspective, this is where I want to go. Um, but I think I didn't realize, you know, when I saw my manager that he's, he's not a data scientist, but uh, he's all day in meetings. I thought because he's, you know, he's from the, more from the business side, but as the data science manager, you're still going to do, um, you know, part of the time coding and be involved. But then like in, in really short time, I realized that I spend most of my time in meeting. Um, so it's, you know, it, it, it was, for me, it was the process of a uh, one year doing this transition uh, that I, at a certain point I, said, I, I told my manager, I cannot, you know, continue maintain the project that I maintained before. And I, I, I need to be a full-time manager to not to be the bottleneck for my team. So I, I feel that's kind of like the, uh, the, the year transition that I had until I, you know, I, I can say that now I'm fully data science manager, um, less doing coding. What would you say is one of the most difficult things then of of being a manager? Um, I think that you, um, you need to, you know, you need to understand better the business as a manager. It's expect more um, than you before as ICT. Uh, so it's another transition. Um, and yeah, I think that's kind of like, uh, you know, it's an additional uh, to understand the biggest, the biggest picture. Um, that was also something that needed to be done. Yeah. And I see another anonymous question that just came in. Um, thinking about hiring, and I know we chatted about this briefly, but what kind of skills would you look, in, look for in a candidate? Um, and how does that vary based on seniority? So entry data scientist to senior. So generally, I'm not, you know, not, uh, you know, that's my opinion. Uh, so when you, when you are having a team of our users, um, you, at the center point, you want to hire people, you know, that you don't want to, during the recruiting, you don't want to evaluate their skills. You want to be beyond 
the starting the you know the interview process that you know those those people are good our programmer and you can focus on the important stuff right the fit for the team and um the the, the how people take a business problem and translate it into a data science solution so that's that's i feel like it, it's important as a when you are hiring people uh is to be able to articulate like that you know starting in a job description uh to write a very clear job description that you are looking for for example our users and what are the skills and then you know we're looking at i'm looking at least at the github if there is if not so i'm trying to find uh, you know good evidence for people that they about their R background. And this is kind of like a, one of the challenging things that not all people have, have the time to go and maintain a GitHub. So, uh, but having a GitHub is providing a good visibility about some skills. Um, and the other thing is like, I know the, the first question, you know, after we are leaving the R skills and the statistical skills decide like, I usually, I want, you know, the way I think of it, like, is, it, is this person, is it someone I want to sit in the morning and have coffee? Uh, it is like the general fit for the team, right? We have a good culture, so it's a general fit for the culture. Uh, then the, the business, you know, the ability to understand the business problem, it's important, uh, be able to be independent. So those, those things that I, I, no matter the role, I think it's important um, things that you should look at. Yeah. And I, I think it's so important that you've also been in that position, position too. So being someone applying to a bunch of different jobs and trying to figure out like what's the best way to get noticed by certain companies as well, or to have your skills show through. Um, and I think it'd be really helpful for people here today to kind of hear that process you went through too. Yeah. So, so, you know, we talked about it before, uh, so when I when so more bit uh, a bit of, of a background when I graduated my master's I I was kind of like I was originally planning to go to a PhD uh, and last moment I decided not to continue and then I was oh my god I need to find um, a job uh, and it was a short kind of like a short notice and I found myself that I'm uh, you know I wasn't prepared. Um, so I, I realized that when you're applying to tons of jobs and, you know, barely get response, the way to get, you know, visibility is to create, to rebrand myself. If you have a certain skills, but you're not rebranding yourself, you are, you can easily can get lost. So I think, I think that the rebranding is super important. You know, it could be through the open source, um, social media. Um, and other, other uh, you know, platform. Um, that's what drove me to start to do the, or one of the things that drove me to start to, to go to the open source and then like also enjoy it. So it's kind of like, was a fun experience. Um, so I, yes, I, I have a few people that I'm mentoring and I always advocate, you know, make sure that you are, showing the world your skills it's it you know you can be very talented but if you're not telling it and you're not sharing it so it's it's very hard for people to recognize it so i think that's kind of like the you know the starting the starting point mm -hmm. do you think one of the best ways of doing that is also contributing to our packages or what way was what was most successful for you so i think there is the person that hired me <laughs> on this call and uh i remember when i i joined uh my my role as data science at apple uh, the first thing he told me that uh there were you know 1000 people applied for this role but you were the only one that we could go in and see on your github that you know time series and forecasting um so i think it it is you know it's 
the visibility it is provide a great visibility if you are interested to go to some domain let's say that you are interested in classification or regression uh, so writing about it's not you don't need to start to develop packages you can start with like you know there is the daily coding in linkedin which is a great i i, I enjoy what um you know those junior people that either in school or right after school doing i enjoy to see what they're doing some of them are very creative and uh it's provide a lot of visibility and it's also open eyes about their work and it's also challenging you to learn new stuff um so yes um that's one way but it's not the only way you, you know writing articles so i think that's worked for me uh you know certain people have certain talent so you should feel what works for you and then go with this route uh, but i think in any way, creating the visibility is important. I'm curious from the audience as well, if this is something that you've experienced too, or, or something that people are starting to do. Um, you could, oh, I'll, you I'll jump in if that's all right. <laughs> um, uh, I think I 100% agree. I think I mean, Rami's um, spot on with this. I've, I've certainly found like in, for my career that being in like healthcare and like working with like sensitive data that ends up being a little bit difficult with like what people can kind of expose on GitHub because a lot of my contributions have always been behind a, uh, a, the corporate GitHub and, and, and in private repositories for obvious security reasons, which makes it kind of difficult that isn't to say I, I couldn't like do something and, and be public about it. And I think that that would be the advice I would give to people. I always like to see, as Rami says, uh, people's kind of like pet projects, um, no matter how big or how small. So, um, but it, but just that I wanted to just add that nuance that sometimes people come from industries that are a little bit more difficult, like the data might not be so readily available and stuff like that. Yeah, and this is sometimes challenging to find, you know, people that are in this world that they cannot share their code, uh, or they don't have the time just to go and, you know, create their own GitHub, uh, fancy GitHub. Um, so, you know, when you, you know, when you're reading resumes, you should also not buy yourself only by looking at the GitHub, but also try to, to find between the lines if there are other Stuff that you know, those people are good at, or you can identify the skills that you're looking. Uh, but definitely having a GitHub, it's you know, it's very. It's I think GitHub is the new resume. Uh, oh, I think that in in schools they should advocate the students to use more GitHub and those tools because this is the future. It's you know, it's not it's the present. Um, so. Definitely, and, and one one of the things like you know, I think the beyond like the selfish things of you know contributing to open source because you want to rebuild yourself, it's also very noble to help others uh, by building stuff. I I really believe in the open source. Uh, I think it's a great thing to be part of this community, no matter the language, and in particular the R language. It's you know I don't need to say how great the R community here. <laughs> It's not uh, found. It's really like a, It's not the most objective. <laughs> the most. Uh, you know, this is this is the hometown. But uh, being part of the open source community, I think it's 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 something I found very novel. Definitely, and I see there's a few other questions that are coming in that are related to this topic as well. Um, but one was anonymous question was how do you get more comfortable with sharing your work and opinions on social media. Uh, it seems pretty important in today's world. Um, so first, I, I'm, I'm, I'm doing a, a separation between my work and my open source contributions uh, and being part of a big corporate, anything that I, I'm, I'm Putting on open source, I need to get, you know, the legal approval from um, my company. But um, 
going back to the to the question um i doing stuff that i'm find them interesting um and i'm also trying not to do stuff that might be you know controversial uh, like for example when i started to do the covid 19 i just saw it as a time series like it was february 2020 which which was mainly in china and i thought okay i did some couple of that i'm enjoying doing data packaging it's very common in r um, i had some you know other packages for electricity and the us and uk which seems to me another time series and maybe we can do some forecast uh, but then like after a few days i started to package realize that it's something i don't want to forecast or you know because it could be sending the wrong uh, message here and i should be careful because this is like pandemic is different from electricity uh, and i don't want to mislead people and then people uh, will say like, oh this forecast it's going this direction and use it and i i just you know it just stayed in the in the domain of uh this is just data each one can do whatever they want i'm not going to do any prediction it's not my role i realized that you know that there are other folks that should this is their professional how to predict pandemic uh so you know it's a it's the combination between find a way to do whatever you think that it's right to do but avoid the stuff that i don't know if it's a good answer to uh, don't you know use the data correctly that's like when i see in the news you know people using data the wrong way uh it's kind of like an example of like what we sh we as a data scientist or people that work with data should avoid Definitely. No, I think I think that's a great answer, Rami. Thank you for for bringing that up too, um, Daniel. I I see you had a question you asked in the chat, and would love to kind of pass the mic over to you and, and have you ask that. Sure, sure. You you can hear me okay? Yep, you sound great. Okay. Um, so it, it was really Rami just related to uh, your comments towards the start about like as a manager. Uh, being more comfortable with doing a little bit less coding in general. Uh, and, and my question is really like certain places, in, in addition to being kind of like the, the people manager, project manager, they may want you to be kind of like the tech lead, the tech fixer. So the people, the, the person that people turn to when they have particular tech things that they, that they need a solution on or where they're stuck. Um, and, and so do you think you can do less coding as a manager if you have like a particular other person who is kind of taking the lead on those tech questions or is that like is that not feasible to be able to be like a people manager doing less coding doing project management and being kind of like the tech lead that's that's a great question i think if you are a diverse team you will have the different people with the different domain knowledge that they could help the team you know the, the, the tech lead in a different domain so uh in my team uh there are people that they are great in docker they are great in shiny they are great in our markdown you know so whenever i have a problem i i know where and everybody know where to go uh and it's not the burden is not on me i cannot control you know i, I cannot be the tech lead for all those domain area uh, and i don't think it's the manager roles uh, the, man, the manager or the team role is to hire diverse people and people from different backgrounds that and develop those skills and let them let the room to grow in a different direction let people to do what they love um and that's create like a very diverse environment that if someone get stuck with some docker or with the shiny modules or something like this uh, data pipeline there is someone that you can uh, go and help you i would be very happy to help you uh, find a solution i hope this is answering your question daniel yeah it, it does it it's very helpful thank you Rami. sure 
Jin or Rami, in, in terms of the tools that you use, and this could be in a prior role as well. Um, did you ever face any challenges or biases against R in the work in your workplace or when you're looking for a job? <laughs> uh, I think there is, you know, the, there is the bias for people that never use R before. Uh, so it's like when you're coming to a meeting and you meet someone and it's like, oh, I never knew about R besides, you know, that where the, you know, where the, a couple of weeks ago, we met with someone that is a software engineer or a software developer, and like, oh, I, I, I never knew that I can do all those stuff, and it was enlightening to, you know, to get this feedback that people were not aware and they discover, uh, kind of like reduce this bias. I think the other, the other, uh, the other part is like when you have a big team that you know you have the people that are more bizarre and the, the tidyverse and the gt plot and the plotly and and it's creating a great discussions about you know um which tool to use and uh you know what what is the right way or probably there's no right way uh you know each one should use whatever they feel like but definitely there is uh, bias, I think, about R um, in a big company that is, you know, the majority are Pythonic. Uh, it's like, why are you using R? Uh, people don't, I think most people just don't aware what R can do or why statistician, it's very natural of us to use R. Um, and I, I find myself and my colleagues explaining why is R is a great tool for what we're doing. Um, but I think when people see the results, they, I think they agree about it. So, um, yeah. Yeah, but, and in that case where you were meeting with say a software engineer who isn't as familiar with R, how do you communicate that? Or is it by showing your work? Um, it's, it's just usually like we're explaining, you know, either we are showing you know some of the deliveries that we we you know we created in R or explain why us as a as a you know data scientist we choose R as opposed to other tools. And you know we are using R whenever R is the best tool to use. And if we need to use Python, we will use Python for other tasks where R um, has less application. So it's not that we are you know, we are, we, are, we are our fanatics and we will use, we, we use our because it's a great tool for what we're doing. And there are other fronts that maybe are uh, as less application Python is most, is stronger. So we'll use Python. So it's, you know, just choose the tools that fit best to your work. Uh, it should, want, should not be like some religious stuff that we are just using R or we're just using Python and, you know, that's R versus Python. We are not there. Um, and Our also some, some, someone now text, text me about batch so we're also using batch a yeah. lot yes <laughs> and julia i see on your your twitter or LinkedIn. so julia is, is more explore, exploratory uh we're still not there i believe that julia is you know is the future uh so i i definitely see in the future that we will Really part of the ecosystem of R is if today, uh, for example, if you want to make your R code efficient, you will use the R CCP or you know you will call some um, C plus plus or C to make your code run faster. So Julia is is another tool that can enable you um, to run your code faster, and it's easy to write compared to other languages. So. I definitely see that in the future, we're going to see more Julia. I remember like in the last uh, CEDA conference that one of the questions in San Francisco to the last on-site, uh, one of the questions to JJ uh, on the, I think in the opening, uh, are we, you know, does our CEDA is going to incorporate Julia 
uh, in our studio and he answered no. Uh, but I, I feel like in if someone in a couple of years, I, I would see Julia also like Python today becoming part of the art studio. I see it. that Julia will be also one of the citizens uh, of uh, our studio. So maybe shifting gears a little bit, I see Frank, you asked a question around communicating to stakeholders, I believe. I'm scrolling back a little bit, but yeah. would you want to jump in and ask that one? Yeah, Rami, uh, thanks for your insights here. One of the things you mentioned, and I, I think I got this right, and if not, please correct me, but you, you were saying you create forecasts and then sometimes the users will say, well, what's going to happen in the future? Um, can you can you make tweaks to your forecast because I want to consider this in there too? And right, your I think what you said is um, your forecast is based on historical data and history, and there's this methodology, and you don't want to go in and manually really dance around too much because um, then it breaks your methodology. And if that if that's what you said, how do you have any tips or tricks for us when we're communicating? To folks, the difference between like, hey, I have this model, I have this method, it works well, we've back tested. Um, and if I start going and taking your intuition and assumptions user and like messing around with that, it's going to kind of break how how it could be used by multiple parties. I'm, I'm guessing they don't love that. <laughs> so I think that you you know the first thing is you, like you need to be honest about what the focus is about, what is what are the limitations, where it's going to fail. And like, for example, focus is looking at the historical and using the historical to predict. But sometimes, you know, like the, we saw it in the COVID, right? That uh, if you look at some of the economical indicator that either went really up, like the uh, unemployment, or went really down, like the flights or stuff like this, that no matter what, your historical data cannot help you. So I think. You know, in the first place, setting the expectation of what the forecast can do is important. Uh, definitely making sure that you're also providing conference intervals. On top of it, I would say that, um, back to your questions, that typically as a data science, you would you want to work with some business analysts that have context about the future, that as a data scientist that we're only looking at the past. Uh, we don't have this co context like, a, let's say, if you are working in sales that of some product and you know that in the future are going to be some uh, campaign or going to be some um, a shift of a new product going to affect the sales of your specific product. And this is where they will do the manual adjustment and you know they will have to advocate to the business why they made those adjustments. I think when there is big uncertainty it's good to have more than one option. Uh, so you can you can also you know you can incorporate to some regression model, and you know by adding some flags and then uh, say uh, if I move this flag up a little bit or down like a think about like a, some kind of like a spline that you can say the spline is going to be longer than than you know you're creating a longer range or shorter range and they say the different scenarios. So I think having kind of like what if analysis when you've, you know, been this talk is not enough, it's probably my favorite option. But I think it's also need, you need to be honest and uh, with the stakeholders about what the limitation of the forecast. That, you know, some people think it's that science is a magic. And I think it's important to, to set the expectation that we are not magician, it is science and there, there are limitations, right? The Stockholm can tell us some story, but you know, the future sometimes is as different. Yeah. I, outside plans. I love that. I think uh, a mistake we, we often make is that um, we go through classes and we go through courses and we believe that there's a problem out there and then there's one model to solve that problem. Like what technique do I know that I can apply to this problem? And then like, we'll call it a day, we solved it. But what you said reminds me of the idea of, like we talk a lot about um, ensemble models, but there's also like the idea of ensemble perspectives. 
So if we're working with users and we, we like, hey, yeah, so there's a forecast model here. It has its limitations. Let's be honest about that, like you said. But then here's another way to look at it. And here's another way to look at it. Um, I, I think that is where us as a group on this call can really turn the tide and get users on board. Yeah, and like you're charging ahead. And I think typically you see that their scientists work better when they have some business analysts that help them to articulate the problem and you know guide them with well uh, some some of the insights about the business that you know just looking at it you might you might not have. Uh, so I think it's important to combine uh, get this help with some someone from the business. Agreed. Oli, I see you um, just had a question there as well around the explainability of models. Would you want to mm -hmm. jump in and ask that? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, first of all, thank you for your fantastic insights, Remy. My name is Oli. Um, I'm working with data at the city of Reykjavik. Um, I had a question regarding uh, when you operationalize models. Um, so I face that often when we have to have a discussion with our stakeholders. Uh, what are these models telling us? Like the explainability of models, like inferring, like how the predictors are actually affecting your response. Um, and I find that to be a fascinating subject. Like um, I, I, when, when you need to work with stakeholders, you need to have a discussion on, hey, did you know that this predictor is influencing your response in this way? And I can show you in a graph, like if it would be a linear model, it's easy to explain, but I'm, I'm curious about this in general, and especially in time series modeling with, with, uh, with what you're doing. Like, do you have to have these discussions with your stakeholders at Apple? Do you need to um, exhibit the, the, the outputs or the models in a way that, um, like how the predictors are influencing the response? Do you show that graphically on a graph or in story? Or I feel like those things are important within the organization. Uh, even though it's obvious to the data scientists. Do you have any comments on that or, or yeah, thoughts? That, that's a good question without referring to my work or anything like this. But generally, I think that there are going to be couple, uh, two types of stakeholders, or generally two types of stakeholders. The one they uh, not necessarily care about the type of models, they, you know, they care about the results and they want to see something, you know, like some forecasted. Um, they can use the other type that they type of stakeholders that they actually they they want to know more about the models that use them may not be statistician or you know background with the modeling but they they either need to articulate it to other to their managers or uh, they need to present it and use it so that they want to make sure that they are understanding the model the methodology so I think in this case, yeah. it's it's nice to do some, you know, to take uh, the time and have meeting to explain them. I'm using mm -hmm. uh, three type of models. So example, I'm using ARIMA. This is how ARIMA model is working, or this is how a linear regression is model using, if you, know, if you are a user of like coming with a shiny example that you can, uh, you know, say, if I'm now changing this parameter, this is how, yes you know, affect the output. I, I, this is how I calculate seasonality. Um, I think that the best tool to explain people is data visualization. It, you know, if you combine it with some shiny application of, or something similar that they can see the interaction of the model with the data. And now when you change some parameter, it's affect the output. I think it's, mm -hmm. uh, you know, easy to explain and get them on board. Yes, absolutely. I, th I think that's a key, really good point. Um, it presents you with an opportunity to have a discussion with your stakeholders in a way you, that you can both relate to. And because in, in my, at least in my work, I, I'm not an expert uh, in the business domains of my stakeholders, and, but I'm an expert in data. So, so we need to have this common ground to have a conversation. And, and I feel like this is the way in, right? And, and not to be overly technical, but present it in a graph and tuning things. Yes. 
it can lead to further insights into the underlying um, processes in the data, right? the physical processes. All right, good. Thank you. Really insightful. You're welcome. Thank you, Oli. Mubanga, and apologies if I'm pronouncing your name wrong. I, I see you asked a few questions in there, and I don't want to assume priority. Um, so I'd love to have you ask your favorite question as well. And uh, I've, I actually, I've enjoyed the, the discussion thus far because I'm in, uh, I, I just became a manager this month, actually. So the, the, the trajectory that Rami has uh, traversed over the last, uh, I mean, at the beginning uh, is similar to mine. I'm very technical in my day-to-day -day job. So I'm finding it hard to uh, be a manager and leave the technical work to the other team members. So I, I think uh, I would like some additional pointers uh, from Rami on that aspect. Definitely, and congrats on the new role as well. Congratulations uh, again. Thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so, so if I understand correctly, like what is the, the question is, um, what really? is, okay. so the question is, uh, what is the, you know, the transformation from to management? What are the, uh, yes. So, you know, I know if you have a, if you are carrying with you the project that you managed, you know, you, you were part of the people that did before those this project uh, as a individual contributor, I think it's a, make sure that you are find someone that will continue. Uh, I think where, you know, this is where I found myself continue to do what I did before carrying my projects, but also start to be a full-time manager. And then it's like in, in terms of time management was very challenging. So I think thinking about transition of your past project, assuming that you still maintain them, uh, is important. Um, and thinking about um, your time, right? Um, there is you know, maybe the, it, at least the beginning you're trying to do to do both your, your previous uh, task and also the new task and then there is a limit of time how much you can walk crazy hours and a long time you will burn yourself so that's i feel my main advice try to make sure there is a good transition uh and focus on the important stuff as a manager like uh you know make sure that your team has whatever they need to success Thank you. And, and there's another question related to this as well from earlier. Being more of a technical person, did you always have those managing skills or people skills or did you have to learn them? Uh, I think I have, I had some of them and, you know, down, you know, you always learning new stuff. Um, so I, I did before my role, you know, my life as a data science, I did some management roles. So working Working with people um, and you know the ability to manage a team it's something that uh, I think I had before, but also data science will be different, so I was also a learning experience for for my end. Um, I think what you know for example, scoping data science project was something that I learned uh, I would say, I don't want to say the hard way, but it was the hard way uh, this year. Um, so there are some skills that I came with and some skills that I learned through the process and mainly related to scoping. And apologies if other people know exactly what that looks like, but I, but I don't. So what does that look like scoping a data science project? I think the, the, the first thing is to understand the business problem and make sure that the business problem is defined correctly. And going back to the, you know, what we, uh, the question from Frankie about, uh, you know, working 
with the focus, but like you need to have some business analyst that, or someone, you know, the, the terms you know, business analyst or data analyst that define what this problem that we are trying to solve. Without it, you it's easy to get lost. Um, so, uh, you know, scoping is, is translate the business problem into data science features. And I think there are two in the project that I, I, from my perspective, there are two challenges in a data science project. One is to define the business problem. The, other, the, the second one, probably more challenging, is to find the data uh, that required to solve the business problem. If, if you are able to uh, solve those two, the modeling part, and you know, it's the, the easy part, and it's like, like the 70, 30, or 80, 20% uh, time allocation between the data and the modeling. That's, I think, uh, the reality. Uh, so if you want to articulate the business problem correctly, it's easy to get lost. And I think that's kind of like the, the, the most important part when you're starting a project. Thank you. And just because a few of these questions have come up so far, I, I think it may be helpful and maybe to ask the audience as well. If you have resources maybe that you think would be helpful for a new manager in terms of like learning those people skills as well, I'd love to hear what has been useful for everyone. Or if anybody wants to jump in as well. Oli said five dysfunctions of a team. One other question, Rami, that just came in um, anonymously was, have you faced a situation where a user is looking for ca causal inferences from a predictive model? If so, how do you deal with that? Um, not necessarily causal inference, but more, you know, the users that to try to understand the, the mechanism of the model. Um, and this is where I would go and sit with that uh, stakeholder and explain my methodology. Uh, we'll try to do it as simple as possible. I always advocate to use, you know, if you can use something simple, use it. Don't it's not necessarily to be fancy. More fancy is not necessarily uh, better results. Um, so, yeah, um, try to explain like our regression is working to and how we use it to solve some problem uh, or a different model is something that I would do. And again, the best mod, the best method is like to create our markdown with the data and with you know going through the process and use some shiny component. That's my favorite tool. I think I saw a LinkedIn post that you had about that as well. Like you don't have to just use a deep learning model just because. <laughs> so, you know, is usually like when I'm talking in a meetups on production, which I did, uh, I had two of those in the, in the last uh, two weeks. Uh, I always say that, you know, if someone come to me and say like, I can create a fancy deep uh, learning models or some machine learning models, that, that's great. But if someone will come to me, I can deploy my linear regression in production. So this is a God. So I think that, um, you know, in the data science world today, at least um, it's more important that you can be able to take your work into production then uh, do, do fancy stuff. Like if I can see my projection, my uh, progress as a data science, like I feel like that I had a normal curve like as any other data science in the room here that when I was just starting as a really junior, uh, I was into this deep learning machine learning. I was curious about it. And over time, uh, I realized that if I, uh, if I need to run a model like to 
for one hour or two hours to optimize it and probably get the same results that I would run linear regression, uh, it's probably not worth it just for the sake of saying that I did something fancy. And then if I cannot communicate it to others, uh, like, you know, deploy it in a dashboard or, you know, deploy it somewhere, it's, uh, it's worthless because, you know, you're not getting the recognition. So today, I think being data, like a full stack data scientist is that you can take your work into production and it's super important. Thank you, Rami. I see Rob H, you've asked a question in the chat as well. Would you want to ask that one live? Sure. Um, yeah, just talking to lots of data scientists and organizations, it seems that often, not always, but often the highest value problems tend to be really complex. And then sort of the dichotomy of the simpler problems, but they tend to be lower value. So like, just curious how you navigate that. How do you make um, those priorities to make sure that you tackle, because you touched, you touched on it before. That's what made me think of it. You talked about the high, sort of the big problems. Um, how do you make sure that the organization is actually tackling those? Uh, that's a uh, good question. Uh, I, I would say that, you know, I might, my, my approach is always to approach stuff with the most simple and approachable solution um and you know i always actually looking at the hanging fruit like if i see that the business all the problem that there, there are you know that there are and usually there are more problems that we can actually solve uh, because you know, we're always bounded by resources I always love to go for first to the hanging fruit and start with those ones because this is where I get my quick wins um, and then move to the complex. Um, it's better to have something than nothing. That's another common phrase that our team is using. Um, and iteration. Um, so you don't need to solve the problem completely you know, to spend one year just to solve a problem if it's a complex. Start with something simple, you know, deliver after a month or two and keep iterating and improve it. Uh, at least you deliver something and, you know, the, the business start to see some value um, rather than just do a long research and maybe get something uh, after a year. I think that there is a trade-off, right? Uh, as long as you can articulate that it's not perfect and you need more time but you going to iterate and it's a process so and the business understand i think that's what i i like to do there are some cases right if you are and it's not my domain but if you are delivering a product for end users so then this is where you definitely need to address the complexity uh and make sure that you solve it before you release it but that's a different domain and i'm not in the domain um i hope this is answering your question yeah thank you rami a question um, from earlier was have you had to teach our skills to members of your team and do you have any tips for doing that so typically they teach me new stuff <laughs> i'm fortunate that i am surrounding with people with very small people that they are um you know we have lunch and learns. You know, actually, um, at ten o'clock, I'm jumping to an internal hour meetup uh, that we have. Uh, so we're trying to do as many as uh, those internal uh, lunch and learn. If someone came and say, "Oh, I, I learn, I solve how to, you know, I learn how to uh, create a pipeline with that tool, or I, I learn how to build this with that tool, or something like this," I so it's like the immediate response in our Slack is lunch and learn. Uh, and so we're trying to create an environment that we share the knowledge uh, and documentation is very important. If you learn something, we have like a big book down that we, any new tools that we're using, we are just documented, trying at least to document, not always doing a good job. At least I'm probably the worst in, uh, 
documented, but um, that's the culture that we're trying to create um, to make sure that we are sharing the knowledge. That's awesome that you all do that. And I know one of the questions on a prior um, hangout was around like getting people to talk as well. And like, how do you find people to speak at these? And I love that you just say you answer on Slack, lunch and learn topic. Seems like a great way of, of getting topics too. There's a, a general question that came in uh, anonymously as well, which can be open to, to anybody. But do you think as an R first analyst or data scientist, you could manage a team of non R users? It should be as long as you're open um, and you, you know, like let's say that if tomorrow I need to manage a team that are Python users, probably I should learn some Python. Because I think it's, you know, as long, as, as a manager, as I mentioned before, you are doing less coding, but like I do review code. I do, I want to, you know, when we have a code review, uh, you still want to make sure that, you know, you understand what other folks are doing. Uh, so I think in a, if you are still in debt management level, um, you should probably be open to learn the other language, if it's a Python or any other language, to be involved and understand what the folks are doing. And I know you, you've already mentioned that team uses both R and Python, um, but someone asked, can you give a general example of when you would use R or when to use Python? So most of the time I'm using R because, um, you know, from the data, when you're loading that you're pulling the data from api it's like the easy ways to you know pull it with and process it with dplyr and all the other great tools um the case that i will use for example i'm using a lot of bash uh thanks to denton that is also here in this call um and when you try to automate our code in some uh command line uh, environment and this is where you know it's easier to do automation uh, call different R, R uh, files or if you're, you're having some yaml file that with a manifest of some job um, instead of doing multiple steps it's just you know you're calling a bash script that doing those steps or in a docker when i'm building a docker i also like to use bash to automate. So that's example, I had some example like that if you need to pull some S3 objects, uh, in the past I used to use to, there is a Python package library called Puto3. So it was kind of like the native uh, library to pull S3 objects. So I use this, um, but mostly I'm using R. I know we're getting to the top of the hour here and you may have a lunch and learn to run to. I'm, yeah, uh, I'm hosting the lunch, I'm hosting this lunch. You're hosting it, okay. <laughs> so real real quickly, if people have follow-up questions, what's the best way to get in contact with you or to network with you? Is it LinkedIn? Probably, yeah, I'm on LinkedIn, Twitter. Um, yeah, this, my, yeah, LinkedIn is probably the awesome. platform that I'm most uh, active. And I could share your LinkedIn here really quickly, but you are also very easy to find there <laughs> if people just search your name. Uh, but thank you so much, Rami. I really appreciate it. I know you have to run, but a great insights. And thank you for, for jumping on and, and joining us. Looking thank forward to, to next week as well. I'm sorry that I know there are a few questions we didn't get to, um, but we can look at those and maybe carry them over to, to next week's Hangout too. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Have a great rest of the day.